Uh, we have three speakers who uh, I think will do a great job of building on this morning's plenary uh, remarks from Mark and um, Luis, challenging us to think about how can we connect our efforts. We know what work needs to be done, um, but how do we connect Are we um, working on the, t no, okay. okay. How do we connect our efforts and really make the impact to uh, advance our sustainable development goals uh, around the world? Not just water scarcity and water quality concerns, but also we know that water management is critical to climate resiliency and regenerative ag. Uh, so the three speakers we have today come from very diverse backgrounds. We have Hugh Scher, who leads Scher Sustainability and develops very innovative partnerships to get work done on the ground throughout Latin America. We have Justin Gibson, who is with the Global Agricultural Software uh, for Lindsay Corporation, so uh, leading the way with data science. And we have David Royal, who is a nutrient stewardship project manager for the Nature Conservancy uh, I know TNCs work very well. I know their ex excellent outreach and um, technical support and the efforts they uh, push on the ground to advance our initiatives. So uh, um, they'll each have 20 minutes and then we'll finish at the back side of the um, session with a half hour of opportunities for uh, back and forth discussion amongst the panelists and the participants in the room and virtually online. Uh, so without further ado, Hugh, I pass the ball to you and hope that the sound system works better. Okay, can you all hear me? Okay. Um, so I come from a, a kind of a different perspective. Um, I haven't talked to many corporate types here. I've talked to a heck of a lot of researchers. And so this is a little bit different approach. This approach is about locking some companies in a room and seeing what they can do together in one very specific basin. My back, I have a, um, a background um, with Anheuser-Busch InBev where I spent 34 years working on sustainability initiatives from brewery to corporate to global. So I like to think I have a unique perspective from an operator running a piece of equipment at a brewery to some corporate folks, to the C-suite and board members um, of, of how to get things done. So with that, I'd like to um, thank folks for um, having me here and the opportunity to represent the Beverage Industry Environmental Roundtable and the local Charcoal Bandito team in sharing what I think is an exciting collaboration. We believe this model has a huge potential to make a difference in other basins and stressed areas around the world. Um, but a disclaimer, it's small scale, like many of the things that we've heard about so far in the conference, but we have high hopes. Um, so essentially what I'm gonna do is run through the basics of the initiative, um, why it was launched, the actors that are involved, its main activities, the learnings and the next steps. I personally believe that businesses, governments, NGOs, et al, are not moving at the right scale, scope, and speed necessary to solve our big water challenges. And I love what Ted Carver's call to action yesterday morning because this is a project that is based on a call to action with a bias for action and doing something even at a very small scale and building on that to do larger things. So let's start by taking a look at who the Beverage Environmental Roundtable is. And Charco Bendito means blessed puddle in Spanish, which I think is a really cool name. And the slides and all the graphics you're going to see are from the local team. I take no credit for that. So beer was formed in 2006 because the beverage sector recognized the need to work together on sustainability issues. The organization, ha organization has developed many practical tools and guidance, which are public publicly available for others to use. One that comes to mind is the true cost of water, which helps facilities take into account things like energy use, chemical use, front and back end 
treatment costs associated with water consumption. So all these things help facilities justify conservation and re reuse projects in their, at their manufacturing sites. The organization shares best practices, benchmarks internal water use, and contributes to many of the global water, packaging, and climate standards by working with leading organizations. So if you think you can think of beer as the largest companies on the planet that produce soft drinks, bottled water, beer, spirits, wine, juice, and other beverages. So here's some here's some beer work examples. I realize the text is really small and they're hard to see. Um, and you know, I'll I'll never forget in 2006 when we had a few of the early members together in a meeting in the St. Louis conference room and how things quickly ignited after that because of the spirit of we need to work together rather than separately. And with that, um, that basis for coming together as beer is very much in line with how, with the idea behind Charco Bendito, that a group of companies can have a much greater impact at the basin lever, level, leveraging each other's capabilities rather than going in at alone. And of course, Beer does all these things on a pre-competitive basis. Um, I believe the level of sharing of the beer members and the collaboration has contributed to the sector's high sustainability performance and their third party rankings. So um, let's start by, let's start talking about Charco Medito by taking a look at this video that gives an overview of the initiative and it's about two minutes long. It's in Spanish with subtitles. Desde que tengo uso de memoria, mijo, nuestra comunidad ha sido un lugar especial por estar cerca de una reserva natural que nos brinda buen clima, agua y otros beneficios. Hoy en día valoramos la protección del agua. Y hemos plantado más de 100,000 árboles en más de 200 hectáreas y aumentó la cantidad de agua. Mejoramos la calidad del agua por medio de humedales artificiales y dimos acceso a agua potable a 200 familias, incluida la nuestra. Pero no siempre fue así, mijito. Hubo una época en la que afrontamos la pérdida y desmejora del agua debido a la tala de árboles, la construcción de vías de tránsito, la contaminación de nuestra laguna y la falta de tuberías. Fue un momento difícil, pero pasó algo extraordinario. Las empresas del sector se convencieron de que la colaboración entre industrias sería clave para salvar el agua y decidieron unirse para dar una solución, ayudándonos a conservar nuestra reserva natural y recuperar el lugar que conocieron nuestros antepasados. Este proyecto se denominó Charco Bendito. Microcuenca Arroyo Grande de San Lucas Con el propósito de conservar la calidad, la accesibilidad y la disponibilidad del agua en esta región De esta manera logramos cumplir el sueño de seguir protegiendo el agua por más años Cuidar nuestros bosques y sostener nuestro hermoso charco bendito de este futuro soñado. El impacto de varias empresas es importante, pero el de muchas es transformador. Es hora de unirse a esta innovadora colaboración. Unidos protegiendo el agua. Um, so that's a very high level overview. Um, been something Felicia Marcus said yesterday really at home, and I don't remember the exact words, but she said something like, don't silo water by just focusing on water. And that water connects communities and is culturally, spiritually, socially, and economically important. And so I think that's what I get out of this video. There's people in every shot. There's wildlife. There's a watershed. There's people harming the watershed but it's all connected for me. And so it's not just about water, it's about the people and the environment in that basin. Okay, so, um, you know, we had 
the beverage industry had been talking about an on-the-ground collaboration for a number of years to complement all the great work on tools and guidance documents and benchmarking. Um, and it started to come together in 2018, talking to the corporate representatives. And Charcoal Bandito was launched, launched in 2020, and it was really a big moment for the beverage industry because it really marked the first time that they did an on-the-ground collaboration together at the basin level. You know, I've talked with many NGOs and companies over the last couple of years, and I think there is great consensus that we must start working together, and that's been a theme over the last two days, um, and that independent actions are not going to do it anymore for water, um, that we need to work together. Um, this is in an uh, important area in Mexico. It provides water for eight of the largest, most populated cities including Guadalajara and Mexico. It's obviously important to the country's economy. Um, and the water challenges that we see in this basin are very similar to what we see in other areas around the world. Groundwater is over, over extracted. The surface water quality is very poor, often due to land use changes, poor policies, agricultural impacts, um, unfortunately untreated municipal and wastewater discharges. So very big issues. Essentially, we chose this area because of the concentration of the members and because of the current and projected water risk. A very important thing that we knew from day one is that we had good local members on the ground that would support this initiative. Without that, um, we would have been doomed. We, we wouldn't have gone there. You have to have local folks that are ready to engage. And so on the bottom there, it's real. I don't know if you can read it, but. It, you know, the initial goal of this initiative was simply to demonstrate that a group of competitors could work together at the basin level. We didn't have high aspirations for infiltration, um, restoration, conservation, all those, those things ended up happening. It was just simply to demonstrate that competitors could work together. And we had hoped that whatever we did would be practical robust and can be repeated in other stressed areas. And so you see it's south of Guadalajara, and then if you zoom in a little bit, you see the town um, just north of there. The red dots are where the actual pro the work is taking place. Um, very hard to see. Um, this is the town right here. This is the project area. This is a, a, a nationally protected area. And this right here is a highway, which caused a lot of disruption to that ecosystem, to that buffer zone. So it's a good area to work. Um, again, hard to read. Um, and this is actually the wrong slide, so I apologize for that. But it, it hits the main point of the process we use. It's, it's very simple. Um, we started with selecting a basin. Um, there's a lot involved in that. Um, we did some verification with the companies to make sure that they were aligned internally and ready to work in this basin, and their local folks were on board. Um, we defined the actual collaborations where we could have an impact in the basin, and then we finalized matters with some formal agreements, and then we started executing. And there's um, a lot more to it, but I think the idea is pretty simple. Um, a key point is that the green steps represent the beer in the global member facili facilitated steps, people like myself, and the blue steps were local member facilitated, which means folks like myself took a big step back. And so we quickly went from English to Spanish, from people who don't live in the basin to people who do, from people who don't know the stakers, stakeholders to folks who might be their neighbors. Um, also, steps one and two took a really long time because this was a very big thing for a trade organization to start doing. Um, once we got the local members in the room together, we were off and running and starting to actually execute within six months, although we waited for communications for some time after that. We wanted to make sure that we were actually doing things that were having an impact before we made a lot of noise about it. Um, so here you see some of the activities listed here. Um, so what started as a quick win project quickly expanded to a holistic, multi-dimensional initiative that has five-year goals for infiltration, access to water, and quality. And there's a lot of climate um, benefits to this initiative as well. And this was not myself. I had taken a step back 
um, at this point. This was all the local team being energized, committed to doing more and for a longer period of time. Um, and so again, we just wanted to demonstrate that competitors could work together and the local company representatives took it and ran with it. Um, and I was particularly impressed with their, um, how they engage the local community. There's been a lot of discussion about stakeholders this week. Um, so they went out and they talked to schools, churches, recreation groups, local officials. They had education and awareness works, workshops for them. And they recognized very early on that people in this basin didn't have access to water and that that had to be part of this initiative. So how, how is this unique? So to our knowledge, um, it's the first bas basin effort that was initiated by a group of competitors. It's practical, it's efficient. Again, a caveat, it is small scale. Probably the lowest, most unique aspect is how the local members took ownership and contributed their talents, whether it was legal support on that simple contract or communications or taking meeting minute notes um, and leading calls. Um, the team governs itself, which is really interesting. They monitor each other. There's no big framework. There's no, there's some consultants, uh, local execution and communications consultants. But they essentially govern themselves. So I like to think of it as a, a project that has a lot of technical aspects, but has been humanized and is connected to the community. So what have we learned so far? Um, I think we validated the model that we used, that it can be used in other places. And a very simple thing, it brought to life how all water is local, right? That's a simple thing that we all talk about. But whether it's moving from English to Spanish, involving the community, using local support, people that live in the basin, you know, it really comes down to what can be done at the basin level by local actors. Uh, a few companies championed the process early on, which made a huge difference in um, having on-site meetings. And again, this all took place during COVID, so that was a huge challenge. And so one thing that was really important is that the first meeting, you know, we, we just listened to members. Um, after we kicked it off and introduced the concept, we just listened to folks talk about water and how it's important to their community and important to their businesses. And we knew at that point that we had something that that we think could work. And things really took off. And so um, I think this is my last slide. So, um, and I'd be glad to answer more questions and all this later. So where do we go from here? Well, we have a meeting next week with a global and local members to discuss how to scale the initiative. Um, the local team is going to present their ideas for scaling the restoration and inf infiltration components of the initiative. They're also looking at ways to address the root causes of the water challenges in the basin, which we all know are very complex. So planting trees is pretty easy compared to working with local farmers on agricultural practices or obtaining finances for to scale or engaging the government on the policy challenges in this basin. A good percentage of municipal wastewater isn't treated here in this basin, or in, in some medium and small industrials are discharging untreated. And so um, I'm, I'm hopeful that nine large companies can go together as one on these complex issues. And I just, I look, I just imagine the potential if they can go as one and start to work on these issues. Um, so we started with a quick win initiative and we're now at the point where I think we've built credibility and have results where we can go and start to at least engage on these bigger issues. Um, also, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention they had a tragedy in, in April. There was an intentional fire in the basin. And um, a large portion of the work area and that green protected area was destroyed. And so that's we're also learning the details on that next week, but some early indications that there's money in the budget to kind of get it back to quickly to where it was and that actually infiltration, fingers crossed, actually might improve a little bit. Not that we want fires, but our understanding is that soil quality wasn't impacted and that there may 
be some positives to, to the tragedy. Um, the beverage industry is launching another collaboration this year using a streamlined process that we employed for Charco Mendito, and the members have a short list of prioritized basins and we will be selecting another, another basin very soon for action. And we've also received a lot of interest from other companies who want to join Charco Bandito and are very interested in the model that we use. So, oh, and I just got an email during, um, after lunch that Charco Bandito was just accepted as a session at World Water Week in Stockholm. So that's also very good news. So with that, I will say thank you and um, turn it over to the next speaker. We do have a minute for any technical questions of about Hugh's presentation. Any questions before we pass the ball to Justin? If not, I have one. Um, so in thinking about how to transfer your experience in Guatemala to other areas around the world, given our global challenges, can you say a bit about um, how you went from the discussion stage where everyone agreed to actually activating a partnership and bringing resources to the table to enable this partnership to achieve liftoff? So once we, um, once we got the global, we're dealing with mega companies here, and once we got the global representatives to buy in, and agreed to a workshop in Guadalajara. And once we got the local actors in, in the room together, um, the light bulb just went off. And, the, and it was very small scale to start. And so it didn't involve a lot of dollars. It was a, a very, kind of very much a test at that time. And so everybody, e every company, and we started with four members. So four members were in, I told a little story at lunch, um, it was really hard to get, once you look at a micro basin, all the, the nine members that are in that basin, they, everybody wanted to work close to their facilities. And so there might be three here and four here, and, and when it comes down to doing a project, um, you, get, you have to select an area. So um, we started with four, um, there's nine now. The folks at it are not directly near the project area, just said, hey, this is important. Um, it's a learning experience, and we're in for, for the starter dollars. So again, to answer your question directly, I just, just think it was a matter of getting those local people who are passionate and live in that basin together. Thank you. Justin. Slides are coming up here. Sorry about that. Oh, Got to hold it. Got it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, so I'm Justin Gibson, Senior Product Manager um, of Global Agricultural Software at Lindsay, uh, Lindsay Corporation. And today I'm going to talk about um, connecting data streams to make irrigation science easier to implement. Uh, so the structure of the talk here today is um, kind of split into four different uh, sections. Um, first to kick off is just adoption and challenges of irrigation science being implemented in the field. Uh, the next section is going to be looking at opportunities and where we can fit in as an irrigation company, uh, specifically kind of with this theme of connecting data streams to make irrigation science easier to implement. We'll then look at some case studies of um, us going out to the field with, with their products to seeing how it impacts um, irrigation and scheduling. And then we'll um, conclude with some future outlook and summary of um, the work. Um, so when we think about irrigation decision making, um, there's a wide range of, or of approaches used on farm when making the decision on when and where to irrigate. Um, we can broadly category or we can broadly group um, irrigation scheduling approaches into two categories. Um, on the qualitative side, uh, we look at growers or water managers um, making the decision on when to irrigate based off of the condition of the crop, the feel of the soil, um, or based off of some kind of personal cal calendar when they turn on the pivot um, or when they start irrigating in, in a typical year. 
Uh, conversely, there's on the quantitative side, um, we see soil moisture probes, ET's um, reports or understanding of crop water use, and computer simulations um, used a bit more limitedly um, at the field level. Um, and so we know that a gap exists between our established quantitative approaches and use in field. Uh, a good study by USDA, um, the IWMS uh, 2018, um, shows that about a third of growers are using our quantitative approach in the US. Uh, when making the, that decision of when to irrigate. And the question here is just why and what can we do as an irrigation company to help? Um, so kind of on that challenges or, or why we see that lack of adoption. Um, so some feedback from the field on why that is, is that number one, qualitative approach are often seen as sufficient, uh, where water managers are t tending to make trips to the field for reasons other than irrigation scheduling. Well, it may be for um, checking for pests, um, crop stage, whatever it might be. While they're in their field, um, qualitative approaches are um, inexpensive and perceived as reliable. On the quantitative side, um, some barriers here tend to be, um, it can be challenging to apply or use um, uh, quantitative approaches over medium or large operations. So when we look at this figure on the left here, if you think about putting a probe in every single one of those fields, um, managing it, trying to take like a checkbook approach or um, characterize how much rainfall you're getting. Um, definitely challenging to do that over the season in real time, especially as the operations get larger or more distributed in space. Um, so with that in mind though, we tend, or we're seeing that on-farm data is growing. Um, on the geospatial machinery side, uh, tons of data is coming in year over year um, when it comes to our as planted irrigation as applied, um, agrochemical as applied, and yield maps. A uh, ton of data there, um, but it's typically uh, um, captured on disparate platforms um, that are hard for growers to access and use um, in real time. Um, and we also see the, uh, e kind of the same things in our in-field sensing side, um, definitely seeing an, an, a number of offerings um, in this space increasing, um, but as far as being able to be kind of captured onto one platform, continuing to see challenges there um, to, to be able to make recommendations on that field by field basis. Um, and, and again, remote sensing, another great example of uh, continued investment in the public and private side, uh, different platforms, different, um, different companies offering those, um, those products. Um, but as far as being able to sum them up and make that recommendation on field level can be really challenging. The good news here though is that on-farm data is becoming more interconnected. Um, we're definitely seeing APIs allowing for more readily available data to be used in agronomic recommendation products. Um, and so from our perspective, um, we currently have a monitor control platform um, where growers can monitor and control their irrigation equipment, turn on the pivot with their cell phone, make sure that it's running through the field correctly, um, hasn't had any breakdowns. Um, and so as an irrigation company, uh, we can support quantitative irrigation scheduling methods by connecting and hosting this on-farm data streams on our platform. Um, but we can also go one step further where we can create digital agronomic products. And this can look like something as simple as turning off the pivot. Um, you know, when, when we capture some significant amount or measure some significant amount of rainfall, and we can even go even further and, and develop something more advanced where we make irrigation recommendations um, uh, using data streams as inputs to drive a crop model. Um, and so one, one demonstration of us doing that here is that we offer an irrigation scheduling tool called FieldNet Advisor. Um, what it does is it ingests our on-farm data to automatically determine planting, um, your planting date, your seed product type, irrigation application, and weather station data, along with any kind of digital soil maps you may have, and kind of take that data layers and stack them um, in order to drive a, um, a crop model that runs at the, the field scale or the subfield scale on a day-to-day -day basis, um, which predicts um, evapotranspiration, soil moisture, and irrigation needs um, in, in real time. And then we then automatically create an irrigation plan using the, those irrigation recommendations from our model. And so we're just loading that into the grower's smartphone or tablet, making it really simple for them to execute those recommendations um, without a lot of work on their side um, for, uh, I guess crunching the numbers is kind of the point there. And so the hypothesis here is that by providing data in real time at the decision point, we can lead to an ROI for the grower in terms of time, water savings, and or yield. 
And so, um, you know, to go out and test that hypothesis, we can do that empirically. Um, and we've done that through some case studies or field trials um, over the Western Corn Belt um, over a number of years. And so we'll take a look at um, some of those efforts um, here in just a bit. Um, kind of that field trial design is it's compro compro composed of um, paired experimental fields. So we have a control field, a trial field, um, and in those fields, um, you know, we, we try to uh, have the only variable between the two uh, just being um, irrigation, um, irrigation decision making. And so um, in the trial field, it follows our, our model, um, but across the field, the only, that's the only difference. We see uh, same seed product, same planting type, um, look for fields with the same soil type. And the point is, at the end of the season, then we collect yield maps, and then we calculate ROI based um, in terms of yield and irrigation costs. So obviously, there's energy costs associated with, um, with pumping water. Um, and so we'll look at three, three examples of us doing this. Uh, so for this first um, case, this case study, it was um, paired fields located in southwestern Nebraska. Um, they were adjacent to each other. Flat fields, loamy fine sand. Um, both fields are planted on the same dates and then harvested on the same dates. I won't go into all the details on the trial setup, but um, kind of the point here, again, is just the, the only variable between the two fields is just our irrigation scheduling approach. One of them is using a model, which is the trial field. The other field is just um, following the recommendation or the, the irrigation um, decision um, based off of what the grower is thinking. And so in this first um, case study or field trial, uh, um, kind of the main point here is that we came across, and sorry about the text being a bit, bit hard to read there, um, but I think in this particular field, it was about um, a $5 return for the grower where we cost them an, a small amount in yield, um, but we saved them about 24% um, in the irrigation application, which returned a significant amount of money um, on that field scale. Um, kind of a similar, similar um, case study that we did um, was pear fields in, in northeast Nebraska. Again, really similar soils. Um, these were low, loamy soils. Uh, fields were planted one day apart, um, but uh, apart from that, um, everything was um, as controlled as it could be. Um, again, uh, saw, um, saw a small impact on yield. Um, in this case, our yield and water savings did end up offsetting each other. Uh, so it was a net, set, uh, net zero, um, but the feedback from the grower was that this is still considered valuable because it saves them time on not having to make irrigation scheduling decisions. Um, so kind of the point there is that we don't always have to return a dollar value in order to provide value to the grower. Um, our last case study here is, again, um, some uh, paired fields in uh, south central Nebraska. In this case, we tested on both corn and soybean in the same fields, um, split, split um, fields again. Uh, both, both fields, again, planted on the same date, uh, same seam product, everything else. Um, and in this case, sorry about the text again, but um, on the corn side, we ended up coming um, slightly positive. I think it was um, on the two to three uh, dollars um, per acre. Um, but on the soybean side, had significant return on, on bushels um, and netted a, um, an ROI or positive ROI for that grower. So kind of just summing all of that up, is that um, across, our yield, or across our experimental designs, um, our, our yields were comparable between the paired sites. Uh, our lowest ROI was observed when model recommendations were um, follow, or followed grower practice, um, so our model reproducing what that grower was thinking. Um, but despite returning a small value, um, it's still, still um, worthwhile when considering that's reducing the time spent for irrigation scheduling. Um, highest ROI was seen um, from energy savings due to reduced irrigation application, um, and which is uh, great to see that producing the same amount of food or a similar ROI to that grower but using less water. Um, and so, you know, future work can focus on larger efforts, uh, potentially interleaving um, irrigation management and control sectors. So instead of doing this across two different split fields, um, doing your own uh, smaller irrigation treatments um, and repeating them across the field. Um, just giving you more observations for some, um, some increased statistical power. And then um, really taking a look at what is the baseline that we're going against when we compare our product, um, our approach relative to the grower, if they're using a soil moisture sensor 
or we're working with um, an, a grower who's um, relatively advanced and knows um, how to ir schedule irrigation well in the field, the baseline might not necessarily be to beat them in terms of ROI, but just reproduce what they're doing. Um, on the future outlook side, um, you know, continued feedback that we get for producing this kind of technology is that um, model setup represents a significant adoption friction point. Um, so coming up with an, an ability to address that automated as planted data input is something we're working on right now. So um, having growers or irrigation dealers fill out, you know, on each individual field, what'd you plant, when'd you plant, and um, how much uh, is, is something that really holds back that that ability to scale this product across larger operations. And so with that in mind, also integrating remote sensing can, um, <coughs> sorry, I'm losing my voice here. Um, integrating remote sensing can also reduce model input requirements. Uh, so, you know, kind of the main reason why we're um, parameterizing our crop model is just to come up with a canopy development and evapotranspiration time series. If we're introducing in or bringing that in from remote sensing, we reduce that model um, input or uh, parameters that we need to um, parameterize the model with. Um, but that also helps um, increase confidence um, uh, based off when you're bringing in those observations from the field. That helps boost confidence that uh, what's happening in the field is being reflected in the model, obviously. Um, and then just on the science side, just continuing to validate model states and fluxes. Um, key things here are soil moisture and evapotranspiration. Um, on the case study side, um, just thinking about future outlook there, uh, tracking irrigation, scheduling behavior at a larger scale and um, over multiple years would be ideal for understanding values and so not just zeroing into small scale uh, specific geographies. Um, but in order to kind of take on more of this work to validate the model or understand how it's impacting irrigation scheduling at a larger scale, we would need a partner to help coordinate this kind of effort. Um, so, um, you know, I guess related to that, um, definitely some potentials for us to contribute to larger ESG collaborations, uh, where we would see our role as um, supporting ir equipment and delivering irrigation recommendations uh, with a longer term vision of um, repeating in different environments, cropping systems and geographies. Um, so just to kind of sum up the, the, the talk here is that a gap exists between established quantitative approaches and use in field. We can help support quantitative irrigation scheduling me methods by connecting and hosting data streams on our platform. Um, and we've demonstrated that providing data in real time at the decision point can lead to a positive ROI in terms of time, water, and, and or yield. Um, although be, we do have a limited number of observations to support that right now. Um, and future work could focus on larger scale case studies in ESG. So, with that, thanks. We have a minute for questions. Any questions specific to Justin's presentation? I farm in Southwest Kansas, and um, we have FieldNet, FieldNet Advisor. I haven't talked to my nephew, I'm sure we still do, but I think comment I want to make too is, you know, labor is very hard to come by. And so we have actually a person monitoring that pivot, which is FieldNet. I mean, so if it breaks down, uh, the pivot flat tire stops, we know to go over there right away. We can shut the irrigation well off, uh, save, hundreds of gallons of water. And then, um, like I said, on the labor side of it, a comment I like to make is, is uh, quality of life. You, I mean, you can go home earlier and spend it with your family. You know, if you've got 30 pivots to watch, we have technology now that can actually watch it closer than we do. We save gas, we save a pickup. So that's, just want to make a comment. That's great, so we're hearing firsthand of the value of that information. Thank you, Justin. Okay, our last speaker for our session um, before hopefully a lively conversation is um, David Royal with The Nature Conservancy. Thank y'all very much, I appreciate it. And I'm gonna change 
a scope a little bit because I don't have a case study. I'm, I'm a farmer that works with farmers throughout the field in Florida, but I want to share a little bit about with you what's happening in, what's happening in Florida. Um, Florida has a lot of restrictions and a lot of rules and regulations that we have to now follow, especially on water quality. And what I'd like to share with y'all is what our farmers are doing in Florida to, to accomplish this in order to stay in business. And one thing that's a little different is most of our farmers in Florida are multi-generation farmers with hopefully the concepts that their grandkids, grandkids will continue the family legacy. So they understand that they've got to take care of the water and they've got to take care of the land. So who is to blame for the water quality in Florida? Many of y'all probably don't know, but here's a chart that I had uh, the university do uh, many years ago for me. And you see the, the yellow line is the line of population and the orange line is the, the declining of farmland in our state. Florida now has 22 million people in it. Over the last 12 years, 900 people a day moved into our state and the new figure is 1,200 people a day. And they're buying our farmland to develop. So we, we have our challenges, we have our issues, we're having to grow more on less, and I think our, our industry is doing a great job. Because as you look, this is in a little community just west of where I live, and it used to be all farmland, and right now today on the books, on top of the 27 developments that are already there, there's 25,000 more homes to be built. And this is probably about 30 minutes from Tampa, and most of these people are working in Tampa or in St. Petersburg or Clear, Clearwater. So they're coming out into the rural areas because the other land is already taken. Florida has BMPs that we must follow. It's a volunteer program right now, but the majority of the farmers, ranchers, and growers are signed up in it, and it says that they will follow the best management practices. These are the third, are, uh, 10 manuals that are, are out there, and they are revised every two to five years. Uh, we have a new commissioner of agriculture that understands ag, so we're going to really work on, on getting these updated and brought up to date because so much technology has changed. Uh, this is one of the companies that I've worked with, and we've actually got it put on their fertilizer bags. So we're also trying to tell the story to the homeowners uh, because that's one of our bigger issues uh, in Florida. What I do is I work with the farmers one-on-one, -on -one, uh, uh, promoting and educating about the 4-Hour Nutrient Stewardship Program, which has the scientific backing behind it that it helps improve and protect water quality. And I want to say one thing real quick, too, because I have a passion for Florida. I'm a sixth-generation Floridian. There's not very many of us left there. And I'm a fifth-generation citrus grower until my dad at 89 pushed our last family grove last year. So we, we've, taken, we've taken our life serious, and, and citrus has been a whole new battle for Florida, uh, especially with the freezes and, and greening and canker and everything else that can come. But I've added a fifth R because I'm a firm believer that irrigation management is nutrient management. So if you're not managing your irrigation right, all you're doing is you're pushing your nutrients out of the root zone. And we're striving to help our farmers keep those nutrients in the root zone, not only for the environment, but it also has an economical impact on their pocketbook at the end of the day. So what I'd like to share with you real quick is some of the things that's happening and some of the technologies. This is a variance machine that uh, is, was in a prototype several years ago, and the farmer can pull it across this field. He can set a distance of anywhere from 20 to 60 feet, and it will do the soil sampling uh, for him and also the pH sampling. So it helps instead of going out there and, and hand pulling soil samples. Plus it builds a map that they can follow. If they do it several years, they can kind of build their own map. Of course, we all know drones play a, a major role uh, in so many different aspects of it with the technology. 
This is a GPS banding machine that a farmer I work with in, in Manatee County. He farms 4,000 acres of potatoes. He actually built this machine uh, with a, a manufacturer there. Um, Allen was kind of unique. You know, when you work with farmers, you try to go pick out a key farmer that everybody else is watching. Because if you get him doing it, then everybody else is going to jump on board, or you hope that they do. But Allen was kind of unique. He's definitely a farmer that steps out of the box, and he's willing to try new things, everything. And he grid sampled his 4,000 acres on one acre grids for five years. And then he went to 10 acre grids. And he figured over a 10 year period, he would have a, a good definition of his land and his soil. And so now he's fertilizing not only by soil samples, but by his soil types. And he's reduced his fertilizer by 35%. And it's all electronic. I mean, GPS driven, so it's doing the fields as, as, as it goes. Then, of course, we have some farmers that still farm the old ways, but they modify their equipment to the new ways. This is a tomato farmer that I've worked with for many, many years. He built this banding machine. Uh, I kind of laugh on his, his bedding machine. He took two vices and stuck on the back to build a groove in the soil. Uh, we farm on plastic in Florida, a lot of plastic. And Gary still uses seepage irrigation, but this is the only nutrients that will go down for that whole tomato crop. He'll give a little bit of foliar spray, but that's it, and he controls it. Now, the unique thing about Gary's farm is, I know this is all Greek to y'all, but the little manatee runs through the middle of his farm, which goes to the manatee reservoir, and that is the drinking water for all of Manatee County because they have saltwater intrusion, and they can't use ground wells. The county is out there pulling samples weekly, and they have never found any nitrates in his water. He circulates his water around the field, and then it goes through uh, a, a, a county park, and then it goes on to the reservoir, so it goes through a lot of filtrations. In the citrus industry, it's changed a lot in the last 20 years. Um, I don't know if y'all know about citrus greening, but it's a little psyllid that's the size of a a pinhead has come from Asia, and it's affected Florida citrus, and citrus in Florida has gone from a million acres to 358,000 acres. And I hate to say it, but the orange juice y'all drank this morning for breakfast is not Florida orange juice. <laughs> but our citrus growers are still striving. I mean, I watched my dad in the 80s lose everything he owned in the freeze when one night and he was bound and determined that he was going to grow an orange grove in Lake County, and he replanted three years. And like I said, two years ago, he pushed his last grove at 89 years old because he said it just wasn't fun. But this, this machinery here has a seeing eye on the front of it, and it reads the canopy of the tree. And then it tells that fertilizer spreader, do I need to speed up or do I need to slow down? So you're putting out only what that tree needs. Whereas when I was a kid and I fertilized for my dad, we fertilized from trunk to trunk, whether it was a 60-year-old tree or a one-year-old tree, everything got the same. So this has been a tremendous savings economically, but just think of all the fertilizer that's not leaching down into our waterways. Like I said, most of our farmers on vegetables, we farm on plastic, we use fertigation, and they do um, all their irrigation through the, the the drip line, I mean the drip lines there, as you see in the middle. And one of the things that we've really worked, I don't know if this is common elsewhere, but has anybody done the blue dye test? We go out to farmers, we pull, we, we shoot blue dye through their fertigation lines, we pull back the plastic, and they can see where their water is. And as you can see, the more you water, the more it pushes down and it's dispersing. And our goal is to keep those nutrients right there in the root zone. So we don't want to overwater, and we only want to fertilize when we have to. So y'all have heard a little bit, soil moisture probes. Guys, that's the greatest technology out there for ag right now in my book. Not only do you manage your irrigation by it, but the probes also measure the salinity so you can watch your fertilizer move through the soil. So do I need to pump more fertilizer on top of what's already there, or do I skip a day? 
I love telling people this because our strawberry growers are doing an 80 split application of nitrogen. Do you corn farmers do that? But we're feeding them just a little bit every few days. And, and tomato growers are the same way and pepper growers and strawberry growers and watermelon growers, you name it, they're all doing it. But these probes are a great tool. I've got a farmer in North Florida that I work with. He tried one out on one of his pivots. Right now he has 38 of them. It takes him 15 minutes every morning to read 38 probes. But last year he saved 290 million gallons of water by irrigating off of his probes instead of irrigating by kicking dirt. And Brooks didn't realize how much he was overwatering. And the other thing was, there again, he was pushing his nutrients out of the root zones. One of the companies that we work with, the probes basically all work the same, generally on, on the salinity and, and the soil moisture. You just find a company that has a dashboard that, that you feel comfortable with and you work with. And this is one of the companies in Florida that has developed a, a, a gas gauge dashboard. So the grower or the farmer or the rancher can look at it and he can tell right where his moisture is. The little green plant, those little lines, those are the roots off the plant. So you can actually see how deep your roots are. These are some just two other different types of probes that we stuck out in a watermelon field. That farmer really didn't realize how much he was overwatering. Um, he went from watering an hour and a half a, a, a once in the morning and an hour and a half in the evening, and now he's watering about 40 minutes in the morning and 40 minutes in the evening because he was just watering way too much. And $5 gallon diesel in Florida, that's a lot of savings. One thing I want to talk about too is, is I, was, I was able to buy uh, 18 probes uh, through a grant and I said, how in the world am I going to work with, with, with the farmers on these probes? So I went to extension agents in five counties and I gave them each four probes. And I have them working with the farmers. I have access to it. Uh, so I can look at it too, but the whole thing is, is teaching the farmer how to use the probe, how to read it, and they feel comfortable. And what was so unique about this partnership was TNC did a little thing on their, um, on their web page in Florida about this partnership and what we were accomplishing. And in two days, my phone started ringing off the hook, and every major newspaper in Florida had this story as a front page story. So we, we really felt good about that because we were getting the word out about what the farmers were doing to conserve water. But also it's a great deal about how you form partnerships because we're all in this together and we've got to work together on it. One of the people asked me several years ago about here you are trying to get people to reduce fertilizer. Um, what, are, what are fertilizer dealers thinking about this? Well, let me tell you, those guys are on board because they know they have to do everything they can to keep our farmers in business. This is a machine that a fertilizer company actually built as a prototype, and they lease it out to smaller growers because they know smaller growers cannot afford uh, a $60,000 fertilizer spreader. They also build it where the, the shoots on the end come out so they can change it to the different row settings of your plants. So it's one machine that can fit multiple multiple crops and so they're, they're getting on board. Um, then I had a farmer. Farmers are creative. Let me tell you, and farmers do their research. I, I had a cabbage grower that was knifing in his nitrogen, his second and third applications, and they couldn't figure out why their plants weren't growing. Well, guess what? When he was knifing it in, he was cutting all of his roots. And if he had to go below the roots, he was putting the fertilizer underneath them. So he did a little research and he said, David, what do you think about a spike wheel? I said, Robert, I've never heard of one. He says, well, here, read this and then let me know. So I was able to get him cost share money. We put that spike wheel in and it's amazing. He's grown the best cabbage crops he's ever grown and he's not wasting fertilizer. We've also got a lot of companies. I know that y'all are in, in the Midwest, y'all are big on cover crops. Florida's getting there. We're kind of lagging behind on that end, but we're, we're working and we've got companies that are coming in. And then again, the biggest issue is how many trips do I have to make through the field? 
Uh, this is a prototype uh, machine that is uh, actually going to roll the cover crop, it's going to chisel plow, and then it's also going to band the fertilizer all in one pass, and then the farmer comes back and he, and he plants. And then this is a machine uh, uh, used for sugar cane, kind of the same concept, they're banding, and it's down on the muck, it's got bigger tires, uh, but uh, those guys are under a lot of pressure. I know y'all have seen in the news probably because it's gone nationwide about blue-green algae and red tide in Florida, and, and the farmers in the Everglades agricultural area get blamed for it. The EAA is 880,000 acres, but the amazing thing, I did pay attention in geography class, it's south of the lake and water doesn't flow north. So these guys are doing a great job. They are actually releasing water from the EAA purer than rainwater. Uh, they had a reduction uh, that they had to meet mandated by law, and this last year they were 69% above that mandated reduction because of their farming practices. One thing that I hope never does happen to anybody else in our farming industry, but these guys have to pay $25 an acre a year to farm in the EAA and that maintains all the CCA ponds and the water systems. Uh, Vertitil, uh, we've got farmers, like I said, cover crops are becoming a, uh, a major thing in Florida. They've been big with uh, strawberry and tomato growers because methyl bromide is no longer allowed, but we're seeing the benefits of cover crops. Uh, this farmer is up in North Florida. We talked him into planting a 45 acre pivot with cover crops. He saw the, after two years, he saw the results and the impact that they had, and this year he planted 12,000 acres of cover crops. Now, we're not planting just one cover crop. We're planting mixtures. We're planting a five to seven species mixture because we want the different benefits uh, that we can get out of it and for them to last as long as they can. This is a story that I want to share. Florida's kind of in a unique position. We have cost share money. I don't know if any other state has that, but our Department of Ag has cost share money and then our water management districts have cost share money and they will help implement new practices for nutrient management and water conservation. Uh, the piece on the, on the left the, with the big tank, uh, that was the first piece that this grower cost shared because he wanted to start, start side dressing his fertilizer on the first two stages of his corn. And the very first year, he reduced his nitrogen by 25 pounds per acre. His, his, his wheels have not stopped turning since we did the first cost share project with him. And he said, I need to learn how to do this better because some of my corn stalks were hanging up in my wheels and dragging through the field. So I think I want to put wide drops on this thing. So he spent $15,000 of his own money the next year to put on uh, Y drops, and he saved 50 pounds per acre on his second year of nitrogen. Now this is over 6,000 acres, and Florida's under a mandate. We have uh, uh, BMAPs, they're called Basin Management Action Plans, and there is a requirement of nit uh, nitrogen reduction that is mandated by the Department of Environmental Protection. And this guy's been kind of one of our model farms, and he is actually 7% of that 4 million pound nitrogen reduction that has to be met on one farm. So we're excited about it, and we're, we're, we're glad that they're continuing uh, to move forward. And then I know y'all are used to high boys in the Midwest. Florida's not. And I, and I tell you my little story about this real quick. Um, in North Florida, we started this thing called the Swanee River Partnership. And it's something that people really need to think about. We're able to bring farmers, industry, and government agencies all in one room. And we sit down and we discuss how can we overcome some of these water quality issues that we're facing in Florida. Well, we, we got to talking about, well, maybe we could do a high boy and maybe that would work. We don't know, but maybe it will. Our biggest problem is our average farm in Florida is only 200 acres. So a 200 acre farmer can't afford a $700,000 piece of equipment. 
But ego started flying with the government agencies that day. One of them says, well, we've got money in a pot that we can give. The next one says, oh, well, we're going to outdo y'all. We've got more money and we'll give. And at the end of the day, we had $800,000 to buy High Boy, and we held them to it. So we're doing 15 farms on a three-year study of getting people to convert to High Boys. And now we have some of the bigger farmers that are now talking about getting them, and we're willing to do the small farms around us because we see the impact that it's going to have on the water quality in our area. So the high boys are great. We're laying the, uh, the, 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 the nitrogen right by the corn plant, so it's all getting there. The other thing that we were able to do at the same time was we were able to buy air seeder, and so we're, we're, we're planting the cover crops before the corn, corn is harvested. We're even planting them in peanuts with it, so it, it, we're, it's multiple use not just one thing. It's a team effort. This is the group that ended up having to buy the high boy, and we were, we were excited to get them all together, and they're seeing the results, so they know that it was well worth their time uh, to invest in it. The other thing that I want to encourage, and I know um, my mind just went blank. The lady from Lando Lakes last night talked about how we've got to get the people that don't know ag out in the fields. And that's one thing that we've worked. I, I, I mentioned the B maps, which was written by Department of Environmental Protection. And the people that were writing the B maps had no ag knowledge, no concept of what the farmers were doing, but yet they were writing all the rules and regulations for the farmers to follow. And we were able to get them out on the farm for six hours. And it was amazing how every one of them said, we didn't realize the farmers were doing this. We didn't realize how the farming industry cares for the land. And it's made a huge difference. We're not where we need to be, but we're making a difference. So I encourage you to get as many people out on your farm as you possibly can. And this farmer, I was kind of a little hesitant when I asked him that I was bringing the Department of Environmental Protection to his farm. And he said, bring them on, bring them on. We need them out here. We need them to see it. One of the things that I've done since I've taken this position is I've strived to get national recognition for our farmers. I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with the 4R Advocate Award, but it's given by the Fertilizer Institute. It's based on their nutrient management practices. And there again, 100% irrigation has so much to do with your nutrient management practices. And I'm not doing this to say, look at what we've done. I'm saying this because they're telling the story and their stories are getting told. And in 11 years, Florida's had six 4R Advocate Award winners and they only give five across the nation each year. So I'm proud of our Florida farmers. I'm proud of what they're doing. Uh, this last year, Brooks actually won I have to look at this, the No-Till Responsible Nutrient Management Practitioners Award. That's given by the No-Till Farmer Group. He is the first one, not only in Florida, but in the whole Southeast to win this award. It's always been a Midwestern farmer um, that, that wins it. So we're, getting, we're trying to get the recognition, and then our Department of Ag every year uh, gives what they call the Ag Environmental Leadership Stewardship Awards. And I actually had two of my farmers that won it this last year. And one thing that's really neat about it is they come out and spend four days shooting a video of the farmers and interviewing them. And this story gets passed around and told. And we use it for the general public more than anything to share the stories and let them visually see if they can't get on the farm um, what the farmers are doing to protect and improve the water quality of our state. Hey, Florida 4Rs are working to improve and protect water quality. Y'all remember the potato farmer I told you about? Y'all see that right there? Let me see, that right there? He has got flag ponds that he totally farms around every year, and they're flourishing with wildlife, with insects, with everything you can think of. And that set of cranes has been coming back for 11 years now. 
So you can't tell me that wildlife and agriculture don't go hand in hand and work together. And this is a statement that I like to use in Florida when I speak, that first of all is an understanding that if you live, conduct business, or visit the state of Florida, you are part of the problem. And once that this is realized, the, problem, the primary question that we all need to ask ourselves is what can I do to be part of the solution? So thank you all. And, and I, I want to say that, that picture, I love that picture. That's off of Gary's farm, and it was taken by a National Geographic photographer. Uh, we had been out there shooting photos. I never knew that you could take 1,700 pictures of a man in a tomato field. But he took that coming out of the field and he sent it to me. And I, just, I, I love that because that shows the beauty of the ag land and, and how we all can work together. Thank you all. Thank you, David. Uh, one quick question sure. for you. Uh, obviously, we're appreciating that farmers are the masters of learning while doing. Um, you, that came through um, in your presentation. Have you had an opportunity to engage researchers and kind of bring them on that journey and calibrate them to the kind of questions and research needs that could really advance your efforts? Florida is, Florida is in a, um, we have B maps that, that have to be met uh, our farmers now have to turn over their nitrogen and phosphorus records yearly. And they better be within the IFAS, the, the University of Florida IFAS, our land grant rates, or they're in big trouble. Our rates are outdated. We know that. Uh, we now have a new vice president of, of the university, and many of y'all may know him, especially if you were from Mar or from the Maryland area but Dr. Scott Angle, and I'm very impressed with him. Uh, his whole background is nutrient management, but the other thing is I'm a small fish in this whole pond, and I can go sit down and talk to him, and we can have a great discussion, and we're working together. But it, it's a collaborative effort that the university, the Department of Ag, uh, private consultants, agronomists, uh, and the farmers and the ranchers and the growers are all working together to to, to achieve these goals that we are, we're mandated. I mean, we have no choice. We, we have several years that we have to meet some of these mandates. Uh, the Swanee Bee Map has five years to meet a four million pound nitrogen reduction and agriculture is responsible for 85% of that four million pounds. Thank you. Well, let's uh, thank our speakers again for fantastic presentations. And we now move into the panel discussion phase of, of our session. And I invite participants in the audience and online to submit their questions. I'll kick it off, um, but then look to Crystal for some help with keeping the, the moderating going. <clears throat> so three very different backgrounds, um, decades of experience among the three of you. Um, can you reflect and share with us what is something that surprised you in your journey? I and mean, what are some of the opportunities you think we have before us to move the needle on, on advancing our sustainability goals, especially those tied to water uh, resource management? OK. Um, so I'll answer that with, with two things. One, one thing that surprised me was in that first meeting with the local members after a kickoff, we put a flip chart up, and I forget the exact question, but essentially it was, what do you think the chances of success are? And they were a little shy at first, and so the moderators, we rated first, and we were like sevens, right? Which we thought was pretty high, but they were nines and tens. Um, and this was probably the best two hours we spent over those two days because we went around the room and gave each person the time to talk about water and what it meant to their communities and I said this before to their company so it's just more than just 
preserving their business. So that was one thing. And then, um, what was your second piece there? Um, how, how to go further, I think, or? Something that was surprising and something that you think could really help us, an opportunity okay. that strikes you. So I, an opportunity that strikes me, and I go back again, because I'm, I'm very corporate jaded, so um, I go back to something that Beth Ford said from Land O'Lakes and about bringing more t people to the table. So the way I see it, and um, I think we're on this journey here, but I think companies have tremendous talents to bring to the table. You know, they're financing folks. They're great at communications. They're great at marketing. They have government affair folks all around the world. Um, beverage companies are probably first and foremost um, lead on wastewater treatment technology and water treatment technology. They're very efficient within their own walls and they can help other businesses in their communities on water efficiency. So um, I think that's a huge opportunity, whether, because at the end of the day, um, beverage companies in particular, um, they may use a small amount of the water in a community, but they're always going to be labeled as the highest water user in that community because of their products. Now, when you add ag, it's a different story depending on where the raw materials come from, but I think a way to scale things is to bring their talents to the table on some of these really tough challenges. When you say those talents, their technical capacity or what? I believe technical and um, I believe that one of the big root causes of our water challenge is policy failures. And I would love to see them engage on something that they would typically say that's the government's responsibility. Because I honestly, again, to what Beth Ford said, is that I don't see us solving these things without bringing a whole bunch of actors to the table. And that's, man, we've heard that on over and over again over the last few days. Thanks. Um, I guess one thing that surprised me in this space is just how curious um, growers or even some of the most talented agronomists I've worked with have been and just kind of the, the water management or soil hydrology space. Um, you know, that's a conversation that I've, I've had with a number of people and the range of questions um, can be really simple or, or extremely advanced. Um, and so I guess I've just, I've rarely had a conversation with somebody on water management where the, the other individual wasn't passionate or had some thirst for knowledge. Um, and so I think the opportunity there is just to take advantage of that 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 curiosity um, and just keep pushing forward with sitting down with folks, talking to them, uh, teaching them what we know, and and I guess hopefully we can change behavior or help folks be more efficient. So. I think one of the biggest problems is we as ag have not told our story. Most farmers are busy farming. They're in the field they, from sunup to sundown. And I can take this and I can send an email and I can make a phone call and that's about my extent of technology. I can read a soil moisture probe all day long on this. But my son is an extension agent and, and I'm gonna have a, a proud dad moment here, but he is constantly sending stuff out about the ag industry. And I think that is so important because he's reaching his generation. If I sent that same thing out, guess what? That's some old man that just sending out something to try to say they're doing good. But if it comes from him, it's very important. And I think we as an industry need to do a better job of telling our story and what good stewards we are of, of our water and of our land. And we understand that if we don't take care of both of those, we're not in business. That is our livelihood. So I, I think that's where we need to strive even more. Uh, there, are, Crystal, any questions online? Okay. Um, so I'll go to the next. Another question then is, um, thinking about 
Well, building, David, off of your comment, you know, acknowledging the great work that's going on, but then thinking with you, we still have a long way to go to reach our restoration goals, to restore our aquifers. We haven't really been able to move the needle since we started doing this work decades ago now. What opportunities do you see? How can we move that needle? We keep saying move the needle, and now I just said what needle. Is, are there challenges you think about that keep you up at night that were missed opportunities? I don't, I don't, I don't think there's missed opportunities. I think there, there are, I, I don't call them challenges, I call them opportunities. But I think the biggest thing that we've got to realize is the issues that we face didn't happen overnight and the solutions aren't going to be overnight. It's going to take time. And agriculture is always a work in progress as new technology comes about. And believe me, that, that's why I think there's organizations out there like TNC that are help, helping to educate the farmers about the new technology, the new production practices. And one of the things that I've always tried to do is, is go after key farmers that everybody else is watching because I think that is how you're going to make the biggest headway. And believe me, the, 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 best, the best way to get your story is at that breakfast table at 5 o'clock in the morning with a group of farmers talking to each other about, hey, this is what I'm, I'm doing. But how well does a general consumer comprehend what the farmer is doing to get that food to their table every day? They don't think about it. I mean, I don't know how it is in the Midwest, but, you know, in Florida, the majority of the people are not ag people. And it would shock you how many think, people think that when that mister turns on at the grocery store, that's where that produce reproduces right there. <laughs> and y'all may laugh, but it is true. It is absolutely true. And beef comes in a box. So the general public doesn't understand what our, our industry goes through to put that meal on the table uh, every day. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump off subject. I shared this earlier today. One of the most interesting men I met was many years ago when he was from Austria. And he said, David, you know what's wrong with Americans? And I said, well, there's a, there's a list. Where do you want to start? <laughs> and he says, they've never waited in line for food. He said, I was a small child. There was four of us kids. And my daddy went off to war. And my mama would stand in line for 12 hours a day to get one day's ration. And he said that was seven days a week. And that really made me think because most people don't really truly realize where their food comes from and they've never really had to wait on it. And, and he said, Mama always kept back a quarter of what we got today because we didn't know if we would get food tomorrow. So that's just something to think about. Just, just if you'd like to share... Um your thoughts about how do we scale these solutions? Yeah, I mean, it's um, definitely a complex topic there. I, you know, I, I think the solutions that we have to bring, um, kind of from just what I try to talk through in my talk, have to be relatively straightforward to execute. Um, we, you know, we have these operations that are getting larger and larger. Um, tend to be more and more spread out. And so um, whatever solutions we bring to the field have to be easy to, um, to manage it and, um, and, and execute in the moment when you're, you've got a very busy growing season. Um, water management, you're engaged for 100 days or so, um, certainly in the Western Corn Belt, on making that decision on when, when to irrigate or not. And so you definitely get that decision fatigue um, so just having having solutions that can take that mental burden off of the the water managers, I think, um, are are where we help scale or help deliver value. So, um, so I'll answer it a few ways. One, I'll take a different take, um, and that I think we have a lot of work to do. Um, I always go back to policy. People are sick of me, especially the Chaco Medito team. Um, but I think we need to um, spend some attention on improving policies 
and take a more preventative mode. And I'm talking about things like land use changes and development and the things that are, are the causes of our challenges. And so I, I would love to see more attention on that. Um, I sent, I worked with a, a, a corporate folks and, and we sent to Charco Bendito a team of kind of a pathway to start to think about these big root cause challenges and they sent, they commented on, they said yes, yes, po uh, poor enforcement, yes, poor ag efficiency, yes. It's like all these yeses to these big complex challenges that are the root causes. So I love scaling things, but we also need to start fixing some things that are causing the, the problems. On the cover crops, they're blowing on with the high boy in between the rows and the corn. What's the goal of that? I mean, do they get an opportunity to graze it, you know, to, to graze that cover crop when they, when they harvest the silage or when they harvest the silage, does it crush, crush too much of it or do you have enough data behind that? We, we've really just started it uh, year before last with it, but one of the problems is, is it's a timing thing. Uh, because most of our farmers up the, up in the north part are growing corn or peanuts or cotton, and, and it seems like it's boom, boom, boom. So that has been one of our biggest challenges is that they always tell us, well, we don't have time to plant them because we're either prepping or harvesting the next crop. And so we felt that this was a way, and then as soon as the corn is, is, is picked, a lot of it's going for silage but then a lot of it is, is for grain corn. Uh, as soon as it's picked, then that cover crop is popping up. We're, we're getting more of the farmers to uh, background calves on the cover crops because most of them up there are not cattlemen. Uh, they got a little small herd, but they're working deals with South Florida. Most people don't realize Florida's a big cattle state. Matter of fact, just a little information, the largest herd in the United States is in Florida, uh, Deseret Ranch, 44,000 mama cows. Uh, but they're cutting deals with the South Florida farmers to send the calves to background during the winter on the cover crops and then shipping them on to the feedlots. But as you well know, fencing's a challenge in farm fields, so we're trying to look for some solutions. Uh, I'm hoping that the electronic wireless fence might work uh, in, in the farm fields. They don't, the farmers don't mind building a perimeter fence, but they don't want all those cross fences in their ways, especially when they're going from field to field to field. Uh, but I think, I think it's got a lot of potential, and, it, and if it, it will help them get them in the ground, that's a plus, because we're trying to really build back the soil health in our state and cover crops is a key issue to it. Any other questions? Hey, thanks um, all of you for the great presentations. This one's for uh, Justin. Um, it looked like the field net tool's great for kind of optimizing within season, you know, irrigation decisions to kind of maximize that crop per drop. Um, but I can imagine situations like in Western Kansas where I do a lot of work um, where that within season optimization can lead to a bad long-term outcome of groundwater depletion or something like that. And I was curious if the tools you're working with have any capacity or insights into how to balance kind of, you know, multi-year or multi-generational goals with those within season optimization decisions. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think, I think the, the the products that we bring um, to market there are telling you if, if you've got this crop, this is the amount of water that you need to apply to avoid water stress. I think where we could use those is just kind of do some scenario testing about if you switch from corn to alfalfa, this is what your water requirement might be and kind of help forecast out on what you could think your yield could look like. Um, so I think 
definitely those tools don't have to be used in real time. They could be used in um, scenario-based approaches. So, and certainly going back historically on, you know, if, if you grew, did this rotation or whatever it might be, it's, it's a great observation and definitely be possible, so. David and Hugh, you didn't say very much about the digital technology or the forecasting tools, the kind of great work that Lindsay is doing. Could you say a word about the role or the opportunity you see for that technology to advance our goals? You're definitely talking to the wrong person. <laughs> but our local uh, implementer in Charco Bendito is actually our technical expert and has done a number of infiltration studies and is just starting to um, talk to the local agricultural community. So um, I think he believes there's huge potential um, for technology, particularly with the growers near Guadalajara. And um, that's all I can say. Is there a hunger for it or a limitation or a frustration or where can we go with the digital technology? The, the, if you're, we're here at a university setting, if you had an, an opportunity to, to provide some guidance for how we could advance that technology. I, I get an opportunity to speak at several of the local schools that have ag departments. And I tell the young people today that ag is probably one of the most technology industries out there when you really sit about and, and think about it. Whoever thought that you could turn on and off a pump with a phone, that you could change zones, that you can read a soil moisture probe, that you can follow your tractor. Um, I get the opportunity to go to the Commodity Classics a lot of years, and, and I know three years ago John Deere uh, released a corn planter that uh, goes 12 miles an hour and has an infrared camera in it that spits out a bad seed. So, you know, technology is, is out there and um, just embrace it and, and learn it and use it. You know, it it's, it's really kind of cracks me up when you go to, and I'm not saying this because I'm one of them, a senior farmer, and he says, let me pull out my phone and show you all my probes and, and what my pressure is on my water lines. So they're embracing it just like young people are because they see the impact and the difference that it can make on their operations. Well, if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank our speakers again for the excellent contributions and discussion today. Um, really appreciated the diverse perspectives and your willingness to, to ask, to answer some tough questions. Thank you. And thanks everyone for attending the session and um, enjoyed the, the afternoon. Thank you.